paying respects to the traditional owners of the land um, upon which the ANU is built. So that's the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. Um, and as we share our knowledge today, I'd like to pay respects to the knowledge and traditions of both of these people, um, peoples and pay respects also to their elders, both past, present um, and emerging. Um, and so today it's my pleasure to introduce Patrick to Decker to the group and I imagine many of you um, have known him for a very long time so he probably needs very little introduction um, but um, I will um, introduce him nonetheless. So Patrick was due to present I believe on the first week of what was to be a one week lockdown. Um, we'd had hoped to reschedule to have him present in person but um, as everyone is very aware we are still in a lockdown um, and it's probably a little while before we'll be able to have in-person seminars. So we have Patrick here today to present to us on Zoom. Um, so Patrick is currently um, an Emeritus pr Professor at the ANU, having been on the staff of the Geology Department since 1988, um, before it was amalgamated with RSES. Back in 2003, he led a three and a half day cruise on the French RV, uh, Marianne Dufresne, to investigate deep sea canyons offshore South Australia. He was accompanied by a large group of both undergraduate students as well as several postdoctoral fellows. And um, the scientific outcomes of this intensive cruise has been some 25 peer reviewed papers, as well as three PhD theses, um, focusing mostly on multidisciplinary investigations of the two long deep sea cores. The work was also supported by numerous European colleagues and their funding agencies. Um, since then, Patrick has also led um, a large international project funded by the ARC, looking at the geochemistry and microbiology of Australian airborne dust. Um, between 1981 and 1985, Patrick was a member of the multidisciplinary SLEEDS, Salt Lakes and Evaporite Deposits project funded at the ANU um, between the Department of Biogeography and Geomorphology at RSPAS and RSES. Um, and so, that, so today Patrick is going to um, talk to us about um, the results from all of this long lifetime of work, uh, which we're all very much looking forward to hearing about. Um, so I'll hand over to you now, Patrick. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm sharing a screen. Here we are. Can you see that? Yeah, that's come up perfectly. Yeah. So um, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, uh, a multidisciplinary study uh, done on cores that were obtained offshore Kangaroo Island. But before that, I'd like to also acknowledge the first inhabitants in Australia. They've been here for well over 50,000 years. That represents two 2,500 generations or even more. And these people uh, witnessed changes of climate, sea level, and the fate of the megafauna, and as well as vegetation and land, uh, landscape shifts, which I will uh, document here. I mean, here you have uh, a glass plate illustrating fish traps uh, on some of the rivers that uh, are no longer being used, but are still there uh, as a testimony of uh, people uh, exploiting the landscape. So until 1980, we knew very little about the quaternary history of the ocean surrounding Australia. And uh, there were two uh, well-known uh, vessels, El Tannen and McConrad, that took many calls and did a lot of seismic work in our region, but very few uh, of the calls from the Australian region had been investigated. And the Bureau of Mineral Resources, now called Geoscience Australia, had a ship that took a few calls, very short calls, and Sydney University had access to Navy vessels, something that's no longer possible, and uh, it's in contrast with what's happening in many countries. But after that, Germans, French, and Japanese vessels came to Australian territorial waters to conduct that research, and some of it in collaboration with Australian researchers. And then later on, we had access to the marine 
national facility vessel, such as the Franklin and the Southern Survey, to commence paleoceanographic work. But uh, of funds were very few. The cruisers were a short time, a short period of time, and there were sometimes less than eight, uh, sometimes six birds for scientists. So I'd like to remind you that research at sea is extremely expensive. Um, a, a day at sea may cost fifty to a hundred thousand dollars, and therefore competition for ship time is very, very tough and rough. And uh, and the processing of calls is time consuming, and again uh, require a vast amount of money. So when we started that kind of work in uh, the early 80s, there was only one mass spectrometer in Australia, and that was at uh, RSES, was built in house, but uh, compared to today, very few samples could be run within a year. So Australia is bordered by many canyons, and uh, you will see some illustrated today, but there was also a great need to map the Australian territorial waters as part of the land of law of the sea uh, documents. So uh, I had access to uh, a formidable vessel, the Marion Dufresne, and uh, exactly 200 years and one month after another French expedition came and do some work in the Australian region. I might add that's uh, also the best floating restaurant uh, uh, that I've been on. And uh, so the National Oceans Office that was uh, based in uh, uh, Hobart funded uh, two cruises. You can see the tracks here uh, from uh, free, between Fremantle and Hobart. The ship at some stage went also to the Dealey land. And I was given three and a half days of sampling time funded by uh, the National uh, Ocean uh, Office. And so three and a half days of almost 24 hours a day working. And uh, there was a lot of swath mapping uh, that was done on the, on the vessel, which now is common instrument that you have uh, on the, the new research vessel, vessel in Australia. And it's permitted you to actually uh, map the seafloor but also importantly, identify potential sites for suitable coring of uh, uh, sediment. So you have uh, uh, an exaggerated map, of, vertically exaggerated map of the uh, canyons, uh, uh, offshore Kangaroo Island, and we spent three and a half days in that area taking water samples, cores, and uh, mapping the canyons as well. But I'd like to uh, uh, refer to the work of uh, uh, the formidable Reg uh, Sprig, who published in 1947 uh, two papers uh, here, one that was published in the Royal Society of South Australia, and he identified some canyons offshore uh, Papua New Guinea, and also uh, some offshore uh, the Murray. And it was exactly the same year uh, that he published in, in Nature uh, his uh, uh, discovery of the uh, Ediacara fossils. So uh, here's uh, a map that uh, uh, a race brick had published uh, in 1947. And uh, it's quite an extraordinary map because it uh, links uh, the canyons, which now bear his name, uh, with the uh, ancient uh, courses of the Murray. And you can see also at the top that he believed that the uh, Paleo River Vincent was also linking uh, to that. But also in that paper, he identified the last glacial maximum uh, water depth, which uh, was quite quite novel, and he was pretty close to being uh, correct. So after the cruise in 2003, uh, 
uh, Peter Hill produced this map showing the ancient courses of the, the Mari. And he also uh, showed that uh, the, the possible uh, pathway of the river uh, coming from the Gulf St. Saint Vincent. And uh, the two calls of interest to us, 2611 and 2607, uh, uh, show their location. I'm going to say a bit more about that. But we went on another uh, Southern Surveyor cruise and uh, in 2006, and you can see the, the pathway uh, that we took on the uh, Lassie Beach Shelf, that covers about 30,000 square kilometers. And uh, we had 2,000 2, kilometers of sub bottom seismic profile and multi beam solar, solar seabed data. So we revised the ancient courses of the, the, the Murray, and uh, no longer do you have the river, the river coming through Buxton Passage. We have found no evidence of ancient channels. But you can see that uh, many of the uh, rivers, our channels, uh, reach the continental shelf. So going back to uh, Red Peak map, and, and ours, I think you can see how good he was with the little information that he had uh, available to him. And uh, we also made a, a map of the uh, <coughs> fluvial sediment found on the Lassie Peak shelf. So uh, if you look at some profiles uh, across the uh, River Murray, uh, near the Victoria and South Australian border, you can see a very large Murray uh, 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 depressions here, or graben, or whatever, or uh, not a graben, I should say, uh, uh, a canyon, and uh, the modern, the, pres the location of the modern day river, a very very small river, and uh, very close to Murray Bridge. Again, the gorge is much narrower, and uh, today the river is 25 meters deep. But uh, uh, the depression uh, was formed uh, uh, or dug by the river during low periods of low sea level. So remember the the top profile. I uh, will come back to that in a minute. So we uh, also had a. Uh, generated an uh, uh map of uh, the sediment uh, on the Lassie Bay shelf. Originally, I thought we would have found a, a lake, but no, very large, broad rivers. So here are some of the seismic profiles that uh, were obtained from the La, um, on the Lassie Bay shelf. And you can see some, uh, the location of some ancient river courses and uh, uh, many of them uh, occur across the, the shelf. And then at the very, on the very edge of the continental shelf, you've got this profile that looks very much like what you had uh, that I illustrated before uh, for the, the course of the Murray and uh, the gorges on the other side. It's about the same dimension and it's, uh, uh, below 140 meters of water depth. So uh, uh, we took uh, two calls on this, not in the canyon, but outside the canyons, uh, because I believe that the time from having obtained seismic work dealt previously before the cruise in 2003, and I had identified uh, quite a lot of uh, substantial sedimentary paths. So uh, uh, on the map that I showed you before, you can see the uh, last glacial maximum shoreline approximately. So this core to 607 was about 15 kilometers only from the uh, shoreline 20,000 years ago. Today it's about 200 kilometers from the, the coastline. So uh, uh, 
you see Lake Alexandrine and Lake Albert in the mouth of uh, the River Murray. And I've got a, a tilted photographs. Uh, uh, also, the direction of north has changed on this map. And uh, uh, there's a profile here that was obtained during our cruise. Uh, we were very close to the coast. And uh, you can see some ancient courses of uh, the river. So uh, uh, we postulated, and then having done quite a lot of work, uh, uh, reading theses that were done mostly at Flinders University, people had found some uh, courses of the river with gravel and, and uh, uh, in one particular case for the river to have gone down. Now, I didn't draw that there, but there's some other uh, paths of the, uh, the Paleo uh, Mary. So, uh, again, you've got uh, the position of the two cores. You can see in the canyons, you still, they're still active. There's still uh, sediment and water coming down. Otherwise, these would have been filled with sediment. And, uh, and remember, I just told you that uh, the Murray uh, changed position and uh, uh, with respect to the, the continent, the edge of the continental shelf. And uh, the principle I used here is that uh, the river may shed quite a bit of fluvial material at sea, but under, near the surface and underwater current can actually trans Port some of that material that is eventually deposited where in the places where we took our cores. So uh, this is, uh, in, in this particular case, is the Flinders undercurrent, which is well documented. So we had access to uh, an exceptional uh, coring device uh, developed by the French, by Yvon Barry. It's an eight ton weight and uh, below which, or above which, not below which you have um, a stainless steel pipe and uh, 60 meters long. So uh, the ship also is built such that you can bring these pipes uh, on deck. And uh, in this particular case, we had penetrated 32 meters of, of sediment. And you can see on the outside of the the barrel uh, uh, where uh, the area that was uh, penetrated. Occasionally you hit uh, uh, a very hard uh, sea floor and uh, you bend the core and you waste a lot of time. And, but you can see in this uh, photograph, a PVC part that's inside that stainless steel um, part. And that's what uh, is filled with sediment and we cut them, the, the parts in 1.5 meter left on the core and immediately kept everything at four degrees, the temperature you have on the sea floor at that particular depth. So uh, here's uh, one of the uh, uh, fellows uh, looking at magnetic properties of, of uh, a 1.5 meter section. Uh, our students, uh, sampling the core, looking for uh, uh, evidence of sedimentology and also uh, uh, microfossils. And then uh, <coughs> one of the other students was asked, and I think she hated me for this, to take uh, color, color reflectance every two centimeters on this core that's 32 meters deep. But two days later, after she and others finished the work, uh, here's the, the profile of the uh, color reflectance. And very quickly did we realize the similarity with the, the CO2 curve for Vostok. So we were able to, within two days uh, of uh, putting a chronology uh, on this core. And, uh, we will discuss only the uh, last 140,000 years of this core. So we collected quite a lot of plankton too, because we knew very little about what was in our, our Australian waters. And we collected quite a few different 
organisms that uh, could tell us about um, the conditions at sea, but also we could perform chemical analyses on some of those shells. Uh, on the, we also found some uh, evidence of uh, octocoral uh, sclerites and spun spicule, but also in a fecal pellet. And uh, uh, you can actually see uh, fecal pellets produ uh, produced by uh, uh, very large blue copepods that we collected. And uh, you can see the plates of coccoliths that uh, are now uh, extremely well studied because they can, the chemical composition of the organic uh, matter of some of the uh, coccolith can be used for different alkanols. You can actually reconstruct sea surface temperature. So it's uh, uh, a technique that uh, is now used by many laboratories around uh, uh, the world. So uh, just an example, <coughs> um, is uh, uh, you've got uh, a sample almost every uh, 200 years for the last uh, 20,000 years. And you can see sea surface temperature changing uh, between the last glacial maximum, which is nine degrees lower compared to the middle of the Holocene. So uh, an extremely uh, abrupt uh, 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 change and a rapid increase. And I'd like to point out too that since 6,000 years ago, sea surface temperature has progressively uh, dropped by the order of two degrees. Of course, today, things are going in the other direction. So uh, just a, a few more uh, uh, items of information about uh, the oceanography in our region. You have the low and current uh, that uh, commences in the, uh, the tropics and the red uh, false color imagery shows uh, really warm water. And uh, this is Cape Lewin in Western Australia. And you can see that uh, especially during winter, during La Nina years, this warm water uh, travels towards uh, uh, Kangaroo Island. In fact, uh, from a, 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 a image that I obtained from a CSRO uh, animation, you can see the direction of the uh, low and current. And uh, there is a little foraminifera uh, that comes from the tropics that normally should not be growing in this area. And we found this foraminifera in uh, large proportions at times in, in the core. Uh, just uh, of interest is that uh, the Lower Carol has only been known for 50 years, but uh, quite a lot of vessels uh, that were uh, carrying migrants when they came to Australia uh, missed Melbourne and uh, uh, because they were under the influence of this fast moving uh, current. So uh, you have a, on the, an adjacent core, a, uh, a profile going back to 94,000 years or so. It's adjacent to the core that I'm going to uh, talk mostly about. And you can see here uh, the percentage of that little foraminifera and see that the uh, the low and current was quite uh, substantial uh, about 12,000 years ago, but during the last glacial maximum, when temperatures had dropped by uh, nine degrees or so, there were very few. The low and current wasn't functioning. And during the previous uh, glacial period, again, the low and current wasn't functioning. But we were also able to look at foraminifera in both cores the percentage of uh, different uh, types of species and identify uh, the presence of subpolar um, uh, foraminifera indicated that subpolar waters were very close to the Australian mainland, at least in the southern part of Australia. So the summary of the major findings from the study of the two courses, we had high resolution 
uh, sea surface temperature record for the last 140,000 years obtained from two cores. A very de detailed assessment of oceanic changes offshore uh, southern Australia and the waxing and waning of uh, oceanic uh, fronts. And uh, a very high resolution focusing on the last glacial maximum and the deglaciation and also a detail of uh, uh, the start of ENSO during the Holocene. And uh, I'm pretty proud of this, that we uh, obtained quite a lot of radiocarbon dates from various laboratories, including from um, uh, ANU. But we also did optical stimulated luminescence uh, on the course, when dating uh, parts of the course are uh, older than the uh, radiocarbon uh, uh, dating technique permits. So, uh, and we also obtain a detailed fine vegetation history of the area. And this is the uh, subject of uh, uh, the detailed part of my talk now. So uh, here are some photographs of the mighty uh, River Murray with its uh, uh, incised profile in, uh, to the uh, quaternary and tertiary uh, formations. And today it's flowing very slowly, it's, but uh, it transports clays, algae, pollen, and charcoal, all of which uh, will go to sea, and some of it will end up uh, on the seafloor, and we manage to recover them in our core. It's two photographs that I took from the web, and you can see uh, uh, a datum algal blooms in the river and uh, a fast flowing river would not have uh, a, a, those algae uh, there. But that's today and uh, in the past was uh, moving much faster and much more water. So uh, at the time of uh, our, our work on the uh, canyons, our, we had a, a colleague, uh, the late Franz Gingele, who uh, managed to uh, visit the Murray Darling Basin. It's uh, 1.06 uh, uh, million square uh, kilometers. And he sampled uh, clays from uh, uh, the various, uh, the two rivers and their tributaries and uh, you had these four different species of clays that he identified. And uh, in general, uh, uh, you can see that uh, the darling and its tributary is a much richer in smectite, and uh, the Murray uh, are, are much richer in elite. So there is a way of fingerprinting uh, the clays in the core uh, based on these ratios. And uh, on the same sample, Gilbert Bayon and uh, Mark Norman uh, looked at uh, the neodymium isotopic composition of the same sample. And uh, very rapidly, you can see um, for the, the scale here of the different neodymium isotopic ratio that the darling is very different from, from the, the Murray and even uh, different values uh, that were obtained uh, from the Air Peninsula and uh, uh, Central South Australia. So uh, in, in 2007, uh, Franz Gengele had uh, looked at uh, the percentage of Elart. Remember, that's a good indication of uh, River Murray. Uh, uh, flow and so two periods of very wet, uh, two very wet periods. Uh, the neodymium values at the mouth of the River Murray are about here, and you can see a, a change. Whereas in contrast, uh, these are the values of the Murray, and uh, with respect to strontium isotopes, uh, and a, a change here. So. Uh, 
France and others were, uh, concluded that this an aeolian uh, phase that coincides with what I've told you before, sea surface temperature decreasing uh, in the last 6,000 years. So going back to uh, 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 the, the area and the core that I'm now going to talk about, uh, and uh, it's important that I uh, say that we have a very good edge uh, model for the core with 23 uh, radial carbon dates, um, as well as OSL dates done by uh, Dan Wilkins. And uh, we were able to link um, with uh, a standard core curve for the in intermediate Pacific by Liziki and, and Stern. And so we're able to uh, have a good chronology for the core. And uh, using three different proxies, the oxygen isotope of our foraminifera, sea surface temperature from the algae, and the color reflectance, you can see the parallel uh, patterns indicating that uh, uh, this is indeed a very good core with uh, no hiatus, no reworked material. So this is a, a frightening diagram, but I just want to show you that uh, uh, Sander van der Kaas, the paleontologist, counted over 35,000 pollen grains from uh, 120 samples from this core. And this is the list of, of taxa and uh, that he recognized in the core. And he used a, a statistical program to reconstruct the pollen zonation. And it's interesting that when you put the isotopic stratigraphy uh, and the isotopic stages, they coincide almost perfectly with uh, the statistical analysis of the pollen. There are slight differences because sometimes there were not enough pollen, uh, sample study for pollen to uh, perfect this uh, correlation. So a summary here, over the last 125,000 years, you can see the percentage of trees and shrubs change and uh, the herbs, the percentage of herbs, and then uh, the two major uh, tree uh, species um, or taxa, eucalyptus and calatris, the, uh, uh, that vary also the, uh, the uh, daisies, and then we uh, looked at charcoal, and uh, a colleague in uh, England looked at uh, a biomass uh, marking uh, indicator. There were algae in uh, the core as well, coming from the marine, including an algae called Botrococcus, which is never found in airborne dust. So we assumed, therefore, that the pollen was mostly transported by water and not by, by air. So uh, calatras that I uh, mentioned, uh, many of you may not be um, familiar with and I went to take some photographs uh, at Shepherd's Lookout near Belconnen and I think you should go and have a look. And uh, you can see these conifers uh, uh, there. And, uh, and again, I photographed them a few months ago in the Botanic Garden and also in Malongo Gorge. And uh, so, uh, uh, they occur often you know, on very sandy soil and very dry environment. So going back to uh, the pollen spectra, uh, uh, and I put in here uh, the timing of the last glacial maximum, the previous glacial phase, and uh, also the uh, interglacial, uh, which is equivalent to uh, today's uh, uh, high sea level stand and warm phase. And uh, uh, I'm going to say a bit more about uh, uh, the significance of some of these uh, taxa. So uh, here you have the oxygen isotope of foraminifera. It's more or less indicates it's a bit like a sea level curve. 
and uh, sea surface temperature, I put a, a marker at uh, 15 degrees centigrade, and you can see a temperature, uh, especially uh, 20, 30 years ago, about nine degrees lower than uh, the mi middle of the, the Holocene. But uh, very uh, high sea surface temperature at the beginning of the, the record. We also were able to look at the percentage of C4 plants. C4 plants are those that you find in uh, uh, warm and moist areas. And again, uh, a decrease of uh, C4 plants during the, the glacial periods. And uh, again, the percentage of uh, shrubs and trees compared to herbs and uh, uh, show a real climatic signal there. Now, concentrating on eucalyptus and uh, calatras, you can see that you have a, uh, eucalyptus during the very warm uh, phases and calatras during the very dry uh, and cold phases. And finally, uh, charcoal counts, if you look at the uh, the particle, the numbers of particles, they seem to coincide with the percentage of the high percentages of eucalypts. So, uh, Sander van der Klaas was uh, able to look at all the uh, sites in uh, uh, southeastern Australia with uh, a pollen record that uh, showed great similarity with the pollen recovered from uh, Arco. And uh, you can see. Uh, how they fit with respect to uh, mean annual rainfall. So uh, uh, for the various ages of the call, uh, it was possible to show the similarity uh, with the, uh, the amount of rainfall, for example, for Lake Tyrrell in Western Victoria. So uh, now going back to the neodymium isotope ratios, knowing, and we were, uh, as I showed you, you were able to tell you if the, if the clays uh, or the clay fraction came from the Murray subbasin or the Darling subbasin and Franz Gingele with the, um, the spectral clays uh, could actually identify the origin of the material. So for example, taking this uh, percentage of this uh, shrub that uh, is often found in uh, 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 dry areas and it's susceptible to uh, fires as well. Uh, we should be able to identify the origin of the, the material. So, uh, uh, and you can see the change of uh, uh, the, the percentage of herbs in the Holocene and during the glacial period, a larger uh, amount of uh, uh, herbs indicating a very dry environment. And again, Calatras uh, found today uh, in dry areas like uh, near Narendra or Lake Frome uh, uh, during the, the glacial phases. And then we also looked at uh, uh, the iron uh, calcium ratio, as a, which we interpreted as an indicator of uh, uh, aeolian, aeolian deposition. So uh, the summary here uh, is in this, uh, what I think is uh, a good summary slide, showing uh, uh, sea surface temperature over the last 150,000 uh, years. And uh, uh, with uh, the, the, the cold phases, um, the temperature is below 15 degrees. This is the time of uh, approximately the time of revival of humans in Australia. Uh, from the uh, uh, Poland database, we were able to, uh, that's the work done by Sander Vanekas, identify the mean annual rainfall uh, for uh, parts of the basin. And then uh, the percentage of charcoal, which uh, I hope that I can convince you that uh, the charcoal, uh, is uh, uh, linked very well with the percentage of, of uh, uh, 
eucalyptus. So during the dry, cold phase, uh, you had very little charcoal. And, uh, and that's when you had calatrus. And uh, this is also the approximate time of the megafauna uh, extinction. I'm going to say a little bit about this. So uh, some of you may have gone to the Botanic Garden a few months ago when they had all these modules of uh, the megafauna. And uh, I extracted some of the diagrams that, from some of my uh, lecture notes from uh, dealing with uh, extinctions. And uh, so uh, the big question is, when did uh, the megafauna uh, become extinct? And it, is, it, it covered the time of revival of humans. And uh, um, so in the core, uh, there's also fungal spores called sporomyella that have been uh, recovered. And, uh, and there's a very specific period of time when these spores disappeared. Uh, and Simon Abelie uh, will eventually give a talk about this, uh, the timing. So I'm not going to say exactly uh, uh, when this happened. But, uh, and we should be able to tell you if it was a climate change, a fire, activity caused by humans or uh, something else. So, so going back to, uh, uh, before I conclude, I'm showing you these uh, various proxies, including the reversed axis here for aeolian dust. And now uh, it's unfinished uh, uh, research here. And uh, I'd like to uh, show you the location of the various sites that we sampled in the uh, Murray Darling Basin and, uh, and also in, in South Australia. And the samples from uh, South Australia were analyzed by Mark Norman at RSES. So uh, looking at titanium, for example, you can see uh, the values are pretty similar uh, across uh, the three uh, uh, basins. and. Uh, so uh, it means that you can actually uh, have ratios of trace element against titanium, uh, as is uh, because uh, the values are pretty consistent across uh, the whole area. Whereas for rubidium, uh, the, the uh, different basins have got mean values that are very, very different. So I was hoping that by doing a rubidium titanium analysis would be able to identify the aeolian component versus the river component. And the same for the conium is not as, as uh, clear as uh, for rubidium. And uh, yttrium, again, uh, 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 was, was used before. And uh, so the uh, rubidium zirconium uh, values uh, uh, overall look uh, quite different for the different uh, basins. But when you plot them on an XY uh, a plot, uh, it's not as, as clear. And the same uh, for zirconium and uh, rubidium, again, uh, it's not as clear. So uh, again, uh, when we plot some of these ratios versus titanium, that's what you get for these uh, uh, river and uh, dust samples. So going back to the core, and this is my last slide, you can see uh, what we believe as material that came from the Murray or the uh, Darling Subbasin, uh, what we believe is the Olean component. And we still, I cannot interpret these. And uh, I think a statistical program that someone may be able to, to help us to identify uh, using different unknowns, uh, different knowns for the, the, the basin and uh, the three basins and try to possibly uh, identify where the material came from. 
So in summary, uh, I documented here a very detailed record of uh, vegetation change uh, spanning the last uh, 125,000 years. Uh, we identified uh, uh, a pollen spectra that came from either the Murray or the Darlingson Basin. So we can actually now see a bit more which part of the Murray Darling Basin received predominant rains. And uh, uh, when uh, we know that uh, the Darling today receives a lot of uh, rain, if it does, uh, in mostly in uh, summer, and the rain comes from, from the north, where the, the Murray is mostly uh, from the, the south, uh, from the uh, uh, Southern Ocean. But I believe, and we have documented that in the paper, that uh, the uh, subtropical conversion uh, zone extended further south during part of this record. So in addition, uh, we identified the alternation between Galatras and uh, Eucalyptus, and, uh, and that Galatras uh, re reached its greatest number during cold and dry period. And uh, basically, uh, Eucalyptus is uh, uh, the generator of uh, uh, charcoal. And, uh, and so we were able to compare sea surface temperatures uh, and other records from the ocean for the Holocene and the entire record and link that with uh, the vegetation uh, on land. So we're still trying to determine uh, the origin of the terrigenous material in the core and that's working in progress. So uh, I'd like to thank uh, a lot of people, the French Polar Institute uh, and uh, uh, various people who helped us on the on the cruise, but also uh, worked on the material after that, and uh, the various funding uh, bodies. So uh, I, I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Um, all right. Well, thank you very much, Patrick. That was super interesting. Um, I yeah thoroughly enjoyed listening to that. Um, so I guess we'll open up to questions. Um, if anyone does have questions, you can pop them in the chat, but also um, we really encourage you to just pop on your video um, and ask Patrick the question in person so it can feel a little more personal in here. But um, if you don't feel comfortable doing that, then do put your questions in the chat as well. I hope it will work for me. I'm not <laughs> I'll help coordinate. It's all right. Um, if no one has a question to start, I've got um, one that I was interested in. Um, so it seems like a really interesting record and incredibly high resolution um, for a sediment core, which was really cool to see. Um, I was wondering if you had any sense that if you were to take a short core from a similar location now, um, whether you'd be able to see any imprint of the um, recent bushfire seasons um, and whether that would give a sense of um, comparison between um, how widespread fires were um, in the past compared to the present day, because it looked like the charcoal in the last 10,000 years was substantially less than during the last interglacial period. Um, yeah, my uh, colleague uh, Germain Bayon is now uh, considering analyzing uh, short course around Australia using uh, a variety of uh, uh, isotopes that are uh, uh, in high concentration when you have biomass uh, burning. So uh, uh, this is work in progress. I think it might take quite some time. And uh, But we were very fortunate that uh, uh, of choosing the choosing these sites because uh, on average, uh, from the work we've done in, uh, with, I studied uh, with my colleagues and students over 50 cores in the Australian region. And in general, 100,000 years is represented by a meter or two. Here, 
125,000 meters is 13 and a half uh, meters. So uh, I think we had guessed very well where to uh, uh, obtain these calls. And uh, there are also multiple calls, it's very short ones that are taken uh, on the seafloor and we have the sediment water interface. And these are the ones that uh, need to be analyzed uh, in the future to answer the question that you raised here. I'll jump in with a question if that's okay. Thanks very much for the talk, Patrick. I've been reading your stuff for years. I'm actually a fish guy, not a geomorph guy, but I do a lot of biogeography on Australian fish, and it's great to see some other names on here that I've read papers of for years as well. So wonderful to uh, be able to listen to this. How much do you think, um, I guess, how does stream flow or discharge vary over that time period? So is it fair to think that discharge was lower in drier times, but then you've got less vegetation What's the role between vegetation and stream flow potentially with these drier yeah. and better times? Uh, we, we have to bear in mind the, the location of the core with respect to uh, the shore. And you remember I had this map showing that the core site was only 15 kilometers from, from uh, the shore during the glacial maximum. And that explained the color spectrum changes that uh, during the glacial period, the core had uh, uh, a much more terrigenous material, and that's why it was darker. And uh, during the high sea level, the uh, temperature, uh, the, uh, there's a phone ringing that's confusing me. The, uh, during the uh, uh, high le sea level, the core was um, uh, beige, there was less material. But we feel that, uh, it was uh, a quite representative of what was uh, in the basin, yeah. The, so the, uh, and during the glacial period, the sedimentation rate was higher, but uh, um, we, we sampled uh, enough material to identify that uh, 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 it represented a good uh, flow of material from the river. Um, during the very high uh, wet periods, uh, like 6,000 years ago, also the river was flowing faster and at that time was shifting sand. This is well documented. But I had chosen a, a core at a su sufficient depth, water depth, that uh, it would not be contaminated by coarse material. Uh, a lot of quartz was found in the core, and I think there was airborne uh, quartz, and that was uh, the material we used for um, the optical, uh, the OSL dating. So, so Patrick, you, you put on a little arrow on your wonderful diagram showing that humans arrived during a very cold period. Now, um, obviously, I guess that means they could walk here because sea levels were so low. But could you correlate um, the appearance of humans with megafauna or oh. fires or anything else? Okay. Um, in a paper that was published in Quaternary Science Review last year, uh, we identified that sea level at the time of arrival of about six, 65 million years ago, sea level was 100 meters below that of today. And uh, also, uh, from work we've done, it was actually very wet in Northern Australia. So it was very suitable for people to, to live there. But it's about around 45,000 years ago from work done, uh, the genetics of, uh, hair follicles that are taken from uh, people that uh, it's about 45,000, 47,000 that people uh, reach Southern Australia. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, you can read my diagrams. I think uh, 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 fire uh, or biomass uh, burning 
occurred after the megafauna uh, extinction and, were, and that was interpreted as there was so much more fuel on the ground because there were no browsers anymore. So we mm. published that in Nature Geoscience. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, I hope that Sam and Hadley will uh, eventually give a seminar because we, we, we know almost exactly with very good chronology uh, at the timing of uh, 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 megafauna uh, disappearance. Okay, thanks. Okay. Patrick? Yeah. Um, if you wanted to look for record of burning vegetation, would you choose to look at a river output or would you want to go subaerial, looking at stuff that's been transported uh, in the atmosphere? Um, yeah, it's a, a difficult uh, thing to, to answer, but the presence of the algae uh, in the, and especially Botryococcus, which is uh, an algae you never find in, in dust, is present in the core uh, in mo mostly, most samples. So I think there's still an unanswered question. Some of the pollen could have been blown and some of it um, was transported by the river. So it, uh, at the moment, interpreting that a large part of the record is fluvial fluvially transported, but not necessary 100%. Yeah, I, I guess, I guess uh, I'm prompted by the observation of the New Zealanders that following the big bushfires a couple of years ago, a year ago, their glaciers were getting covered with soot. So that was all windblown stuff. And I was thinking the party line would have been surely looking at cores from the Tasman Sea that the arrival of indigenous people led to an increase in charcoal uh, production, but that yeah. presumably was mainly blown by the wind. You're not looking at big river systems, are you, compared with the Murray Darling? Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting that today you have a lot of fire activity because, because of the predominance of uh, eucalyptus on the landscape. In the past, there were times where it wasn't there. And the big biomass burning, recognized by the analysis of the level glucosine uh, uh, biomarker, uh, can uh, tell us uh, more that um, I, I think, well, I, I don't want to answer the question too much about the megafauna extinction. But uh, I think that uh, humans uh, were burning the landscape uh, quite commonly. Perhaps I'll answer it differently. When we looked at the comparison of the pollen record for the last interglacial, um, when there were no people around, we don't have any modern equivalent in the vegetation today. Okay. So uh, the humans have definitely uh, modified the vegetation uh, assemblages. Right. Does that answer it? Yeah, that's, no, that's very interesting. Thank you. Um, I guess, yeah, we're getting up to 2 p.m. now, so we might um, call it on questions now. But if anyone does have any um, further questions, I'm sure Patrick is happy to take emails um, and tap with you about that um, further. But thank you again to Patrick for a really fascinating talk today. Um, and I don't know if Foon wants to tell us